when I was in the Philippines, I knew that I would see a lot of poverty and some really difficult and hard things, but I don't think anything could have prepared me for this one community that we ended up going to. In this community, it was a slum community, and it was on a beach. And often when you think of a tropical beach, you think it's like this beautiful, serene, kind of picturesque beach. But on this particular beach, these families had built their homes out into the water because this was the only place that they could find to live. And they built their houses into the water on stilts because if those stilts weren't high enough, then during high tide, their homes would flood. From afar, it kind of looked beautiful in this sort of ironic way that was colorful. And But when you got closer, then you could see this, these like pieced together homes. Yeah, like almost like they were falling apart. Like you could tell that when it rained, there might not be enough protection and things like that. And so you really started to see the heaviness and brokenness of this community. So as we spent some time there, we started seeing that the kids during low tide would go down onto the beach and there was this kind of muddy, sludgy water sand mixture on the beach and they were digging through and they started to explain that they were digging through for glass and shells and little pieces of garbage that they might be able to sell for a little bit of money. The injustice of this place started to weigh really heavily on me and even just looking at the adults in that community, a lot of them were just sitting there, not really doing a lot. And I started to think like, when you're living in poverty as an adult, it um, really weighs heavy on you. And there's this kind of sense of hopelessness of just, yeah, just really kind of living in this really harsh reality. So when I came home from the Philippines, the injustice of this place really continued to weigh heavily on me. And to see how we live in Canada in such privilege and we don't even realize it and often take it for granted, and yet there's this place in the Philippines, and again, like this place I started to realize repeats itself all over the world in different countries. There's slums like this, even bigger ones, more children that live in places like this, and it can get really, really overwhelming. And for me, I started to ask like, how could God allow such injustice to exist in the world? I started to reflect on this and understand that this isn't God's heart for the world, that he really desires to see justice in this world. And we see that through Jesus and through God's heart. And so um, he's inviting us to be a part of bringing justice and restoration in this world. And he's not calling us to save the entire world because Jesus already did that, but he's calling us to do one thing and to do what we can to partner with him in bringing justice in this world. And so what I ended up doing is I sponsored a compassion child from that community in the Philippines. And for me, that was a way of just understanding that hey, I can't save everybody, and that's not what I'm called to do, but I can do one thing, and I can reach out to one child and start to make a difference in that way. I think justice is about realizing that God has put us in so many places and situations and put people in our lives where we might see something and say, that's not fair or that's unjust and understanding how God is calling us to respond in those moments. And so maybe it's a kid at school who's always by themselves and they're lonely or gets bullied and being able to step into that situation and show God's justice by being a friend to a classmate or maybe it's someone that really struggles with school and you're saying like, oh, it's so hard for them and to be able to understand like, hey, I have something that I can help them with and to be able to respond in that way. And that's really how we can bring God's justice in our everyday lives by showing kindness and um, being loving in our everyday lives. I'm Alyssa and I try and seek justice in everything that I do. Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the Meeting House live stream. My name is Mark. I am one of the pastors here at the Meeting House, and it is so good to be together today. What an incredible story from Alyssa. Alyssa is a part of the Meeting House here and um, is a part of our One Story team and has shared many times. And I just find that um, that story so powerful, that um, living out and learning and leaning into God's justice. Um, so incredible.
Well, if you are new with us today, perhaps you're visiting, perhaps you stumbled upon um, this service today, I just want to let you know, I just want to remind all of us why we're here. And that is to worship Jesus, to learn about Jesus, ultimately to become more like Jesus. That is, um, that is what we're doing here. And in seasons like this, it is so good to do that together. It's just so good to come together and learn and uh, worship and become more like Jesus and um, do that together as we wrestle, as we walk through, through life together. If you um, are a part of the meeting house, you would know that this was another tough week for us. There was more news that has come out, more things that we are processing and that the overseers are um, looking into. And so we continue to pray for them. We continue to uh, lift that process up. Um, but I know that in the midst of these hard seasons, it leaves us with questions. It leaves us with uh, certain unknowns. Well, before I get to that, if, you, um, if you're wondering what I'm talking about and you didn't receive that email this week, you can email uh, the chair of our overseers board, which is like our board, at meggie.john at themeetinghouse.com and ask for that. You can get on the email list there. Another place that you can go is themeetinghouse.com slash connect. And you can fill out that form and ask to be placed on the email list and to uh, receive that information. But when we're in seasons like this, a number of things can happen. It can feel isolating. It can be triggering. It can uh, remind us of uh, hurts and pains of our past. It can remind us of things that our friends or people in our lives have experienced or people in our community. And that is the case for all of us right now. I know that um, this week I personally have been wrestling with um, deep questions, right? And I'm sure I'm not the only one out there. Questions like, uh, what do we do when the kingdom of God doesn't feel near? Or, um, as you know, and as we've been talking about, we are on the road to hope, which has been so beautiful, so encouraging. And as I've said over these past weeks, the road to hope has many stops, right? And we are along that journey now. But what if, uh, what if the road to hope actually feels a little bit more like the road to hopelessness? Right? What do we do if we don't feel like singing or worshiping or praying or reading the Bible? What do we do? Where do we go? Well, I want to encourage you that if that is how you felt this week, is that, if that is where you find yourself, you have come to the right place. You have taken the best next step for you to process that, for you to grieve uh, this is a safe place where we can um, be together, where we can wrestle with those questions. We've got lots of different ways that you can do that, whether that's kind of in an online forum in the chat or the Discord channel, uh, or maybe it's in a home church where you can interact with others who are processing this together. We have those that are meeting both online or in person in local parishes. There's many different ways. One of the ways that I found encouragement this week that I would um, hope encourages you as well, was turning uh, to scripture, right? When we don't know what to say, when we don't have the words, perhaps we can go to the words of those who have gone before us. And I was so encouraged by two passages this week, the first um, from Jesus and the next from Psalms, and I'll, I'll read them, right? As we think about the question of where do we go, I, I ended up in Matthew 11, and this is a verse that we've read lots around here. So uh, you will probably have heard it before. It might be familiar, but I want to encourage, encourage you, even if that is the case, um, to, to pause and listen and reflect on what do these words mean to you now? Do they mean something different? Is there some, um, some encouragement that we can find in these verses from Jesus? And he says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, all who are weary and burdened. Is that you right now? Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Are you in a season where you feel like your soul needs rest? where you need a safe place, Jesus says, come to me, 
and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is that place where we can go to for rest for our souls. Not just physical rest, not just um, to be fed, but to be, uh, to experience rest for our souls. Feels like we might be in a season um, where the burden on our souls is heavy. And then secondly, um, as I was processing what God is like in these seasons and um, wrestling with um, faithfulness and is God faithful and what do we do in these seasons? I turn to Psalm um, 145. Psalm 145, 13 to 15. You can read it with me if you have your Bibles near. The writer says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Boy, I love that, right? When it feels like everything around us is crumbling, when it feels like there is no foundation, God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all, the, all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. Oh, I just love that. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. You know when life can feel so heavy that it's just your shoulders shrug. You maybe lean forward, your posture is a bit... Um, poor. <laughs> yeah, that's when God lifts us up. That's when he draws near. And we are in a season where God draws near, where he is so close. Whether we realize it or not, he is so close. So before we continue our service with musical worship, with teaching from Jimmy, as we continue our series on hope, um, and then I'll come back and wrap things up at the end. Let me pray. Let us pray together as we enter into this time together. Jesus, um, yeah, we just come to you as we are. We acknowledge that we are um, bowed down, that our souls need rest. We look to you who are faithful and true. We pray that um, you would be so near to us that we could feel your presence wrap around us. I pray that for whoever is listening right now, that you and your Holy Spirit would just be so present in whatever space that they're in. That we all might um, know your love, that we all might um, know your faithfulness, and that your promises endure that you are our rock, that you give rest for our souls. Yeah, in a time where we don't have the words, where we don't quite understand, where we uh, struggle and wrestle with the things around us, we look to you. We acknowledge you as our foundation and ask that you would continue to hold us, that you would continue to help us walk down this journey as we go together. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Feel free to stand with us if you feel led, or just sit and reflect. in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for 
blessings Jesus you don't owe me anything and more than anything that you can do I just want you I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up. I'm caught up in your prayer.
just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to left us and what we're facing you saw coming and you planned accordingly you don't just leave us to sit here alone you give us your presence you give us community you give us support and resources and we're so grateful and God we look to you we find our stability and our sanity in you and may that always be true God how shaken we feel. May we stand firm in your truth and in your love. Far be it for me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see, and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. So 
through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, that we stand firm on that regardless of our circumstances you are with us in the storm and we truly <laughs>
the third part of our series, um, Road to Hope, where we've been leaning into these postures through the Lents and the lengthening uh, season, suffering alongside walking with Jesus on this road to hope, this journey towards uh, Easter. And this morning, um, I mean, if you've been following along in our guide, the word, the phrase, the theme, the posture was supposed to be uh, forgive. Um, but I've affectionately renamed it uh, the sermon this this morning. If we uh, put up that first slide, this is the 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 sermon that I don't really want to teach because I'm not really feeling very forgiving these days. And maybe you feel the same way too. Please forgive me, sermon. <laughs> this is rough. Um, on one hand, when you think about forgiveness, uh, we can like offer it quickly, um, glibly, uh, um, unknowingly, unthinkingly. Like when you're, you know, you're at a restaurant and you know somebody bumps into you, or you know, you get your Uber Eats order wrong, and somebody's like, "Oh, I'm very sorry about that," and you're like, "Oh, I forgive you, no problem." And on the other hand, on the other side, on the other end of the spectrum, forgiveness is so much more dark, difficult. Uh, muddy, long, uh, almost impossible to process at times because forgiveness um, at its deepest level requires grief, sorrow, and admission of wrongdoing, and to repent, to repent. And I feel like that's the season uh, that we are in as a church, that we don't want to rush quickly and glibly, unknowingly, unthinkingly, to, to forgiveness without taking all the steps towards repentance that we uh, need to take first. Now, if you think about that word, repent, think about that word, repent. Even just as I hold up this sign, what does this conjure up for you? Right, doomsday, the end of the world, it's all over, turn back, turn around, Stop it. I remember a number of years ago, I was at a Christian conference, a huge Christian conference, and um, it was like, it was, a, it was a conference to train pastors to be better pastors, leaders in our context, and uh, we got word that there was like a protest out front of this huge stadium. This is like eight to 10,000 people, uh, all, you know, headed to the, to the same spot, and sure enough, we got there, and there were all these people with signs like this protesting, and me being the extroverted personality that I am, I was like, I'm just going to go talk to one of them because maybe they've got this wrong. Like, maybe it's not a Leafs game. Maybe it's something, something else. So I went up and talked to this guy, and I was like, hey, man. He's like, hi. And I'm like, I like your sign. He's like, do you? I'm like, do, do, like what, do you, what is the aim here? What are you doing? Do you know, like, what this is? And he's like, yeah, it's like a church conference. I'm like, oh, okay, so are you guys, like, anti-church? And he's like, no, no, we're very pro-church, the right kind of church. We're very pro-God, the right kind of God. We're very pro-Jesus, a very specific version of Jesus. And as we talked and, like, the distance just grew further and further, I remember, like, asking him, do you think it's working? And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, you're holding up a sign and just like throwing out this concept of repentance that's actually rich in Christian tradition, but there's no communal connection, no conversation. Do you think it's, it's working? And the conversation sort of stopped there and I went inside and he stayed where he was with the others. And I remember thinking like, is this the best that we have to offer? You know, like either cheap forgiveness or just a blatant and sort of like arresting word like repentance. Repentance, brothers and sisters, has everything to do with how we orient our actions as Christ followers. The word repent is actually, uh, it just means to turn around. So when you hear that word, when you, when you think about all of the imagery that that conjures up, uh, it's actually like a, it's a, it's a walking metaphor. This is not like uh, an angry parent from another room yelling at their children, like, just stop it. It has everything to do with how we uh, get from one spot to another. Repentance requires something of us.
Now, we're going to cover quite a bit of Scripture this morning, um, so if you have your Bibles or if you want to take it out uh, on your phone, we're going to jump through three sections of Scripture, and you'll be talking about it uh, quite a bit in home church. Um, so if you are visiting for the first time, or you're checking us out online for the first time, there's plenty of options for you to get connected uh, to a home church, and if any, if ever there was a week um, where we need to be in tight together, processing honestly together, and moving towards repentance together, this is the week, this is the season. So, turn in your Bibles to um, the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. So, if you've never used a Bible before, go to the middle, turn to the right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third book, and then go all the way to the number 15 and to the number 18, the number 15 and, and, and the number 18. And then later, as we wrap up, uh, move towards our close, we're going to be in James chapter 5 as well. So, like I said, lots of Scripture buckle up. And so, for the sake of time, um, we're going to start in Luke chapter 18 and uh, fast forwarding to the story of the rich young ruler. Anybody heard the story before? You're kind of familiar with it? Yeah, a few of us. So, what's happening in this context is um, Jesus has, has started his ministry. He's chosen his disciples, his talented, his, his students, who he's um, teaching a, a new way, a better way, a way that embodies law, that fulfills law, a way that embodies what it means to be fully human, and a way that embodies the love ethic that Jesus uh, espoused throughout his ministry. And so, he's teaching parables. He's teaching a storytelling as a means to get to a point. And as he's, he's teaching through and his audience is getting wider and wider and larger as he's walking, we read in Luke's gospel that a rich young ruler comes up to him. So this rich young ruler, now um, what a rich young ruler would be, we don't really know. Could have been a lawyer. Could have been somebody from within, uh, you know, the synagogue tradition, Jewish tradition. It could have been somebody that, you know, grew up in Torah, but had accumulated wealth, had accumulated, uh, you know, large plots of land, and also knew his Bible. And so as the story goes, they're walking along, this rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inher inherit eternal life? And Jesus turns to him with his disciples in tow, with probably quite a crowd around him, and says, why do you call me good? Only one is truly good, and that is God. Fascinating. Fascinating. Jesus takes them back to the centerpiece of the law, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. Takes them back to the centerpiece of what he's already communicated that he knows. And he says, yes, you know, he says, follow the commands. You know the commands. What do you have to do in, to inherit eternal life? Follow the commands. And, and the rich young ruler responds by saying, of course, of course, I've followed these things since I was a boy. And then Jesus kind of chirps back at him and says, okay, but there is one thing that you lack. Sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. And what do we read happens? The man goes away sad or with his head low. And Jesus doesn't chase him. Jesus lets him go. Now, there's so much intentionality. There's so much depth of meaning, of richness, and nuance in what we're reading when we walk through this text. This is what Jesus is communicating, the notion of teshuva, of turning around, of going the other way. You have this gentleman who's come, come up to him, has amassed all, all that he can in life, and this is like his la last check mark in his, uh, you know, bucket list of like coming to this rabbi and saying, I respect you, I honor you, so what is the last thing that I have to do? Because it seems like I've gotten it all right, and Jesus confronts him with what he's gotten all wrong. And it's not arbitrary that Jesus says, come and follow me. In the religious tradition, the rabbinic tradition at the time, this was the call of a rabbi. This was, this was a rabbi extending like the olive branch, the invitation to a student to change everything about their life and come and follow. Literally, Jesus is not just saying like, oh, this is a party trick. This is like a test for you. Instead, he's saying, yes, I see that you're honest, you're earnest. What, what is it that, that, that qualifies you for eternal life? What is this all about? Sell all of the riches, all of the stuff that you thought qualified you. Come and follow me. Turn around, get back on the path, following who and how God is, and see how this changes your life. I mean, if you think about it, if you parse out and keep going with the story of what could have been, we could have been reading about like another disciple added to the mix, but instead, it, the text says that, that the man went away sad, for he had amassed much wealth. He'd followed the powers and principalities of the world and was not willing to turn 
around, was willing to come up to Jesus and espouse like some semblance of respect and maybe even, you know, uh, willing to confess his sins, but he was not willing to turn around, and Jesus just lets him go. It's a haunting story. I remember the first time I read it, I was like, is Jesus being a jerk there? Like, what is going on? And the disciples ask him further, like, what just happened there? And Jesus says how difficult it is for somebody who is caught up in the trappings of material wealth and thinking that they have it all together that, that, that prevents them from turning back to the path, how difficult it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom. And the disciples come back and say, like, I guess it, like, where does that leave us? It seems impossible. And then Jesus comes back with a note of encouragement that's not cheap grace, that's not cheap forgiveness. He says, with men, yeah, it seems impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. Jesus invites them to reorient, to change, to turn around, to come to him, to come and follow, rather than just to sit and think and philosophize and confess something uh, with one's mind. Repentance is all of the steps from here to there. Repentance is all of the steps before, in between the hard work of making what is wrong right, the tough process of coming back to the path. It's the name for when we realize we are on the wrong path. The name for when we realize we have done it wrong and God is inviting us to turn around, to repent, to start the journey or come back to the journey of moving towards forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, in the, in the narrative of Scripture, there's three ways that this most typically um, works out. There's, there's uh, three words. There's no real singular word for repentance and confession and admission. It's parsed out in a few different ways. So, three words, Naham, Metanoia, and Teshuvah. Naham, uh, naham Metanoia, and Teshuvah. So, Naham is the, the po- it's a posture. It's a posture of leaning in, of sitting in sorrow and of grief, of recognizing one's wrong, and then also being consoled by community. It literally means to, to take a breath, to sigh, to, uh, what has happened? Metanoia, uh, which we've used um, a ton at the meeting house. We've talked about metanoia a lot from this stage at the meeting house. Metanoia is the changing of one's thinking. It literally means like the thought after, to look back and to think, I probably shouldn't be thinking that way. It lives more in the philosophical. Metanoia is literally changing the way that we think, changing our mind, thinking differently. And then third, and most importantly, Nacham, Metanoia, and Teshuva, which is a change of action. It's changing what you do. It's changing and reorienting what our hands and our feet and our bodies do based on the grief that we've experienced, based on the change of thinking that translates into how we actually live our lives. And it feels like this is what God is saying to us in this season. No more living in the philosophical. Change, turn around Brothers and sisters, we are being called by God back to the path that is good. The teshuva, the movement of God returning, turning around, following Jesus to what is good, to what is better. A change of action, turning back. I think if I were honest with myself, even in the season, I tend to be okay. I mean, we taught about it a few weeks ago with the, the, the breath, the sigh, the nacham giving ourselves space to grieve, comfort, take a breath. We may even take inventory of how we're thinking and the dangerous and destructive and divisive patterns that our hearts and minds left unchecked can turn into, that can turn into action that harms and hurts others, metanoia. But too often we stop there. I have stopped there. We lock ourselves into the seclusion, the silo of sin, perhaps confessing to God but to no one else confessing to God of realizing our thinking is wrong, but that's where it stays in Jesus, brothers and sisters, is calling us to more, to change our actual behavior, to change our actual patterns, to repent, to turn around, to teshuva, to change our metanoia to our teshuva, to translating it into actually what we do. 
Now turn back over to Luke chapter 15, which is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time, which is the, the parable of the lost son. So l- like I said, Jesus is, is storytelling to get points across. So uh, Luke chapter um, 15, starting in verse uh, 11, and you'll see it here on the screen as well. So Jesus' storytelling with a wider community mixed up of Jews and Gentiles and Greeks and poor people and some wealthy people who are kind of suspicious, Jesus is storytelling to make a point. And Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And then not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach because he was hungry with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses... When he thought about it, he came to his senses, metanoia. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Next slide. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned. I've done what is wrong against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. Sorry. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead, but is alive again. He was lost and now is found. So they began to celebrate. Next slide. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Now, if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 21... Typically, most often, scholars would say uh, when Jesus, or even the rabbinic tradition at the time, um, uh, good storytellers in the rabbinic tradition borrowed from from two areas. One, from law, uh, going back to the the law, the Torah, and would extrapolate based on current events. And then two, from common current examples, what is happening now. So that as you heard the story and sorted out the, 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 the teshuva, what does this mean for me here and now, you would draw conceptually on the law what you've learned and then practically what you've seen. And so some scholars would suggest, A, he's referring back to Deuteronomy 21, which was a law in the Deuteronomic text, which said that if you have a rebellious son and he refuses to listen to you as a parent, bring him to the elders in the village square and there stone him and kill him. Other scholars would suggest this was like a common story of rebellious sons, of rebellious kids, of teenage kids. I see some of you nodding your heads already. And so Jesus is borrowing on rich uh, biblical examples and common, current, everyday examples. So as you were hearing the story, you'd be like, I know what he's getting at. He's talking about Deuteronomy 21. Yes, justice, justice, justice without mercy. We know a family like that. We know a family that that happened to, and this is crazy. And then Jesus goes bananas in the story. First of all, a couple things to know. As a, the youngest son in a family, you had little to no rights. And actually, the father never des- decided or divided up the lot, the family parcel. It was the oldest son who got to decide that. So for a youngest son to come to a father and decide, give me my money, I'm out of here. And then to go to a foreign country, to go outside of the, the geography of God, and to be serving as a servant with pigs, you're like crossing off all of the religious like uh, bucket list items. Like this is how you do it wrong. This is on the path the opposite way. Now as a Jew, or maybe even hearing this story again, hearing this story, you'd be like, this guy is going to get what is coming to him. This is a God of justice. And you would likely identify with the older, with either the father or the older son. But Interesting, where does Jesus go with the story? 
into the experience of the younger son, the rebellious one, who goes off, he, he, he moves in a different direction of who and how God is, he blows all of his wealth, he, he is the lowest of the low, serving with pigs in a foreign country, and changes his, he grieves, he's filled with sorrow, nacham, and then he changes his way of thinking, I, I've sinned against my father and against God, if I'll, I will return and confess, I will make it right, and then he teshuvas, moves back to his father, not expecting full forgiveness, not expecting full forgiveness, but at least he'll have like a job, Maybe his father will allow him to be a servant. And then Jesus enters the heart of and starts explaining the heart of the father, of God. What happens here? You would expect justice, a lack of mercy. There's repentance and then there's payment required. And instead we see the father even risking his own shame, sprinting across the field, seeing his son in the distance. And the way that uh, the, 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 the text renders itself, especially uh, in, in the Greek text, this is like, um, it, it's a funny image. It's the father running across to the son, and the son's like trying to, oh, I've practiced a speech, and the father's just like enveloping him, like, and you can like almost picture the son being like, just can I, I want to say my speech, just hold on, hold on, hold on. The father does not care because he's seen the examples, the sorrow, the grief, the turning back around, the repentance that's led to action and inclusion back into the family. And the only thing that the father has to offer is grace, is forgiveness after confession. And it's fascinating that Jesus leaves the story unresolved. We hear that the older brother, the, the, the religious uh, mindset, the metanoia, Somebody who's got it organized up here sees what's happening and then approaches the father and says, I have done everything that you asked, and yet this son of yours, not brother of mine, this son of yours comes back and you throw a party for him. And the father said, we had to. Your son, your brother was lost, but now is found. Your brother was far off, was gone, but went through the process of sorrow, of grief, of admittance of repentance and teshuva, of turning back. We had to do this. And we don't hear the rest of the story. We don't hear what the older brother's uh, conversation is like. Jesus just leaves the story with us and invites us in to say, like, where do you find yourself? Where do you find yourself? As Jesus navigates that all three are required, all three of these postures are, are required to fully heal, grief, pain, change of thinking, change of action, turning around, turning back to the path, returning to good, the toe of the family home, the embrace of the Father, these are all made clear in the story, but where do you find yourself? How do you navigate through the hurt with the hope that there will be healing? So, brothers and sisters, this morning, as we navigate just more devastating news in a season that has already been so painful, how will we heal what hurts in this season? I think our journey, just like this story says, begins with grieving. Grief, nakam. Grieving our own sin, our own blindness, our own uh, complicitness, our own apathy, changing the way that we think, turning away from actions that hurt and harm ourselves and others, and turning back to the love of God. And then I would like to offer one more thing that I think makes all the difference for how we do this in community. And I'll, we'll close with this. It's in James chapter 5. Uh, and just for the sake of time, um, um, yeah, we, we won't... We won't read through it, but just for the sake of time, let me explain it. So James, this is the brother of Jesus who, who has grown up with Jesus in the home, who's followed Jesus' teaching, who's professed faith in his own brother being the Messiah, the way to understand and exemplify God in the world. And through James's letter, as, as he writes, he talks about the tongue, like how do you speak to each other? How do you care for each other? You know, that the, the, the tongue left like unbridled can be like hellfire, can be destructive. And then he moves towards like healing. What does it take to like move towards healing and wholeness in this new way, in this new kingdom? 
He talks about, you know, uh, um, faith without works. Like if it's all just metanoia and there's no teshuva, what is it? It's empty, dead religion. Following Jesus is a holistic following. And at the end, talking about like how, do we, how are we made whole through this journey? How will God heal us? Through confession. Now, in a religious way, as a Jew, you know, reading this passage, confess your sins, you would expect the next word to be to who? Confess your sins to God, right? Which would have been a common thing, you know, in Jewish custom and certainly in Christian uh, tradition as well. Confess your sins to God. Go into your prayer closet with your Bible. Take out your journal and write your confessions. And James does not address that at all. He leaves God out of it. He says, actually, confess your sins one to another. The people that are sitting beside you, the people in your home church, the people in your family, the people in your faith community, confess to them. Do not leave it in your metanoia. Take it to your teshuva. Your faith life should translate through your hands and your feet. It should make a difference in how you live and how the world sees you. Confess your sins one to another so that you may be what? What? Healed. Brothers and sisters, this is the call for our church today. Confess your sins one to another so that we may be healed on this journey together. It is not enough to confess in our minds. Certainly God receives that and forgives. It moves into our action, to our hands and our feet, to our teshuva, the direction of stepping back onto the path towards good, towards God, towards healing and wholeness of walking through the process of grief, of sorrow, of necham, of metanoia, of thinking differently, of changing the way that we think, and then also teshuva, the way we act. Thinking the right things together. Doing the right things together. And then when we mess up, when we harm and hurt instead of heal, confessing to each other together so that we can be truly healed. So brothers and sisters, as we navigate together through this season of deep pain, may we embrace this posture of repentance. It is ours to hold. May we embrace this posture of repentance, of teshuva, of turning back to the path together, knowing that Jesus is there with us and that Jesus is taking us to what is good even through pain. My friends, may this be a season at the meeting house of teshuva, of teshuva, of turning around back to the love of God in action, in community. May this be our witness. And may God be with us as we fail and struggle. May Jesus make it so. So Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name and together we all said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Jimmy. Wow. May this be a season where we turn back together. I just love that. And I love that um, we are in this together. We confess together. We grieve together. We turn together. That is what this is about. I mentioned this earlier, but if you are looking for a place to process this, I would encourage you to go to the meetinghouse.com slash home church, find a home church near you, whether it's online or in person. There are lots of opportunities. Uh, As we grieve, as we uh, struggle through this season, it can feel so isolating, right? We can feel alone, like no one else is feeling the things we are or questioning in the way that we are, but that's not the case. We are in this together. And we turn back together towards God, to the good path, as Jimmy was saying. Hey, it has been... Um, a special time to be together. Uh, Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Go in peace. We are praying for you. Um, We are in this together. Till next time.